When I was pastoring in Columbus, Ohio, one of my high school students came up to me and told me that Westboro Baptist Church was going to be at one of the local high schools the following week, and they were going to be picketing. Now, have we all heard of Westboro Baptist Church? If not, awesome. If you have heard of them and know what they're all about, I am sorry. It's a church from Topeka, Kansas, made up of pretty much one giant family unit, and, and they're notorious for their hate speech. They go all over the country and protest at like colleges, military funerals, pride parades, and their whole driving message is that God hates you, and you're going to hell. Just a lovely bunch of folks they are. Many of the high school students that were a part of my church identified as LGBTQ and, and knowing full well that arguing with people over how they treat others usually gets you nowhere and possibly always makes things worse. Being the incredible pastor that I was then, I told all my students that, that we should show up on that date they were protesting and take funny pictures around them just to let them see how ineffective their approach really is. And it worked exactly the way I was hoping it would. You know, they were yelling at us, and, and one of the guys who was a part of their church just kept yelling, turn or burn, turn or burn, turn or burn. You know, and at first I thought he was just concerned about me getting a sunburn since it was sunny outside, and you know, he wanted me to shift positions. But then it clicked that he was telling me to repent or I'd go to hell. Turn or burn. Fury, wrath, fire, torment, judgment. Eternal agony, endless anguish. That about sums it up, doesn't it? Hell. You know, God loves us. God offers us everlasting life by grace, freely, through no merit on our part. I mean, there is nothing that we could ever say or do to earn this grace God offers us. It's completely free. Unless, unless you don't confess you don't repent, you don't trust and accept Jesus or respond the right way. And if you don't act, then God will torture you forever in hell. That's the Christian story, right? I mean, isn't that what Jesus taught? The concept of hell is, is one of my favorite subjects to discuss with people because it's easily been the most destructive topic within modern day Christendom. I mean, how many people have been turned off towards faith because some ignorant Christian told them they were going to burn in hell forever. How much damage has been done and how much hurt has been caused because of the way we think about the afterlife. I love rethinking this ideology on hell because if your theology on hell doesn't make you a more loving person, then get rid of that theology. And that's my goal today, to see how a proper theology on hell can actually make us more loving towards our neighbors. Now, I've introduced many Hebrew and Greek words to you in the past sermons because many of those words have such depth to them. You know, there's a richness to the biblical languages, and, and when we explore what those words mean and how they were used when the Bible was written, they're accompanied with a certain significance that you just don't experience within the English uh, language translation. And this is especially true when it comes to the concept of hell. In the Hebrew scriptures, or what some people call the Old Testament, there isn't an exact word or concept for hell other than a, a word that refers to death or the grave, the pit, and, and the depths. This word is Sheol. Psalm 18 says, the cords of Sheol entangled me. Psalm 103 says, The Lord who redeems your life from the pit. Psalm 16 says, My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. To put Sheol in a way many of us could probably understand it a little bit better in our time is by calling it purgatory. This is where our Catholic sisters and brothers get their ideas of purgatory from. Sure, there are differences there, um, but, but this is essentially the same idea. It's important to remember, though, that the Jews who wrote the Hebrew scriptures, they had been oppressed and enslaved by their neighbors, the Egyptian, who built pyramids and ornate coffins and, and buried themselves in rooms filled with gold because of their beliefs about life after death. 
those specific beliefs appear have uh, appear to have been a turnoff for the Jews, because the Jews were far more interested in the ethics of and, and ways of living this life, which we'll see more of when we get to Jesus's teaching. It wasn't about life after death. It was all about our present reality. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that, that Jews, they don't have a set orthodox belief on what heaven and hell is. For whatever reasons, the precise details of who goes where, when, how, and with what, and, and for how long simply aren't things the Hebrew writers were terribly concerned with. So that's really about it with the Hebrew scriptures. That's Sheol and a couple references to the grave and the pit. Now, let's hop to the Greek scriptures. The actual word hell is used roughly 12 times in the New Testament, almost exclusively by Jesus himself. For our one English word hell, there are actually three Greek words used for that translation. And the first word is Hades or Hades. Now, how many of us have heard this word before? Yeah, very popular, you know, very popular word, even outside of, of the Christian faith, the Jewish faith, you know, in Greek mythology, all of these things, we've heard this word. Hades is an obscure, dark, murky place. It's, it's actually the Greek version of the Hebrew word Sheol. In Luke 10, Jesus says, you will go down to Hades. In Matthew 16, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And the second Greek word for hell is used only once in 2 Peter chapter 2. It's this word Tartarus. And it's a term that the author of 2 Peter borrowed from Greek mythology, referring to the underworld, the place where the Greek demigods were judged in the abyss. It's not really super important for how we perceive our ideologies of what hell is. But it's translated in English, so when we see it, a lot of times our minds go to this fiery pit and all of that. And, but it's just not meant to be that. But the third Greek word translated to hell is probably the most important word for us to examine, which is why I saved it for last. This is the Greek word Gehenna. Ge, G-E, means valley, and henna um, means hinnom, H-I-N-N-O-M. Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. And this was an actual valley on the south and west side of the city of Jerusalem. Hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, this is, this is really important, terrible things happened in the valley of Hinnom. The kings of Judah sacrificed babies through fire to their various gods that they worshipped. The Jewish prophets in the Hebrew scriptures called Gehenna cursed. So after the child sacrifice stopped, because this place was considered unclean, it became Jerusalem's city dump. People tossed their garbage and waste into this valley. And there was a fire there burning constantly to consume the trash. Wild animals, they fought over scraps of food. And when they fought, their teeth would make a gnashing sound. Gehenna was the place with the gnashing of teeth where the fire never stopped burning. Interesting. What's in our minds right now? All the stories we heard about hell growing up. See, Gehenna, though, it was an actual place that Jesus' listeners would have been familiar with. So when Jesus says in Matthew 5, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell or Gehenna. And it's also in Matthew 5, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell, into Gehenna. His audience would have known exactly what he was talking about. It wasn't a thought to them about a place that non-Christians go after they die. It was a real place in their lifetime where there was no life to be experienced. The Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, was a place of gnashing of teeth, of constant burning, of no life. As we learned a couple of weeks ago, heaven... For Jesus wasn't just a someday, it was a present reality. So Jesus blurs those lines, inviting us into the merging of heaven and earth, the future and present, here and now. And it's the same with hell. So then how should we think or not think about hell, just as we did with heaven? 
In reading all of these passages in which Jesus uses the word hell, what is so striking is that people believing the right or wrong things isn't his point. He's often not talking about beliefs as we think of them. Jesus is talking about anger and lust and indifference. He's talking about the state of his listeners' hearts, about how they conduct themselves, how they interact with their neighbors, about the kind of impact they would have on the world. When I was around 13, my mama, she met a guy named Jim, and they started dating. And he quickly moved into our house. Jim was a funny guy. He was smooth with his words. He knew how to talk to people. And at first, he treated my mama like a queen. And it was fantastic to see her happy. Jim had recently been released from prison uh, for being a crack dealer. But he said he was rehabilitated. And if you know my mom, she isn't someone to hold on to anyone's past. You know, she doesn't judge them. So, so I thought, okay, yeah, let's do this. They can date, whatever. And things were great for a while until Jim started drinking. His excessive drinking then led him back to using and selling crack again. And when he was drunk and or high, he was mentally and physically abusive to both of us. And it even led him to him being sexually abusive to my mom. This man was cruel and mean to everyone around him. No one had anything positive to say about him. As a pastor, when I say that we should love our enemies, he's that person that comes to my mind. No one else in my life has remotely come close to causing the pain he has caused. So do I believe in a literal hell? Well, not in the afterlife version, but hell on earth and some of our present realities? Of course I do. I tell that story because it's absolutely vital that we acknowledge that love, grace, and humanity can be rejected. From the most subtle rolling of the eyes to the most violent degradation of another human, we are terrifyingly free to do as we please. Yet that freedom that we obtain can be a source of redemption and reconciliation. The scriptures are abundantly clear that all people, from all nations, all races, from all tongues, will be drawn in and reconciled back to God one day. We could call this heaven on earth. And a proper theology on hell lines up our focus on how to live lives that brings that type of life, the heaven on earth, to our home. This, my friends, this is anti-Gehenna. Again, what is Gehenna? A place where no life exists. What happens then when you serve your neighbor? What happens when ugliness is turned into beauty? What happens when love breaks through the barriers of hurt and brokenness? New life springs forth. And new life is anti-Gehenna. No matter how painful, brutal, or oppressive, No matter how far people find themselves from home because of their sin and difference and rejection, there's always the assurance that it won't be this way forever. Healing, redemption, forgiveness, kindness, love, new life bursting into our current reality. Anti-Gehenna. Lives of anti-hell. There's this great story in Luke chapter 15 where Luke, or I'm sorry, where Jesus tells a parable of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and loses one. The shepherd leaves the 99 and searches for the one until it is found, and when it's found, he throws a party and a banquet. What a striking image of the lengths God will go to to ensure every person has life. Whatever you've been told about the end, the end of your life, the end of time, the end of the world, 
Jesus passion, passionately urges us to live like the end is here, right now, today. Love is what God is. Love is why Jesus came. And love is why Jesus continues to come year after year to person after person. God is love, and to refuse this love moves us away from it, in the other direction. And that will, by very definition, be an increasingly unloving, hellish reality. So may you experience this vast, expansive, infinite, indestructible love that has been yours all along, all along. May you discover that this love is as wide as the sky and as small as the cracks in your heart that no one else knows about. And may you know deep in your bones that love always wins. Love itself is anti-Gehenna. Amen.